Hey Optomancers, Chris here. Uh, so a couple weeks ago I talked about my favorite ranger spells in the game uh, and one thing that has come up since then is people have asked me about paladin spells. And paladin spells of course are a little bit different because if you are a paladin often you're using those spell slots for smites. Though the thing I find with paladins is those smites tend to get overused because often I think we would be better off casting spells. So let's talk a little bit about what paladin spells are out there, which ones I think are really good, which ones I think you might want to use as spells instead of as smites. So welcome to Tree Monk's Temple. Now to be clear, playing a paladin doesn't mean that you should be casting spells instead of smites either. It's probably going to be a mix of each. So unlike a ranger, we wouldn't expect to be casting as many spells because some of those spells are going to end up being used for smites. Because smites can actually add a ton of damage to your paladin, especially if you score a critical hit. Uh, or even if you hit multiple times in a round, if you're willing to use the resources, we can add a lot of damage, particularly to undead and fiends. Still, there are a number of Paladin spells I think are worth casting as spells. Let's start with our first level spells. And the first spell I want to talk about is the Bless spell. If nobody else in your party can cast the Bless spell, I think the Bless spell is a really useful spell to cast. Now, the biggest difficulty of a Bless spell is it uses your action to cast. And you're a Paladin, so you're kind of expected to be going up front and doing damage. And instead of that, you'd be using an action to set up this spell. Uh, so. I wouldn't necessarily cast Bless in the midst of combat with my Paladin most of the time because we're sacrificing that action and that's kind of a big deal. But if we can cast it before combat because we know a combat is about to happen or we have a chance to prepare for it or maybe an enemy's at too far range so we can't get to them this round with a melee attack and we're a melee character so we can use our action on something else without sacrificing too much then the Bless is really useful because remember it's not just adding to our hit rolls uh, but often a d4 is enough to turn a miss into a hit and it's not just for us It's for two of our allies as well, uh, but also we're adding to saving throws 1d4 to each saving throw including the concentration saving throw to maintain this spell now It only lasts a minute. So this is a one combat spell um, Still if we have a few characters in our party that can really make use of an extra d4 to hit then if we can cast this beforehand we can increase the offensive capacity of our party probably more than a spell like divine favor that will give us a slight damage boost the next first level spell i want to talk about is compelled duel now compelled duel is circumstantial and i would only use it on a character that is intended to be kind of a lockdown character a character that's a tank he's got great armor class probably uses a shield and maybe has the defensive combat style then compelled duel makes a lot of sense because we can target an enemy with it and then that enemy would have disadvantage to attack anyone but our character it's only a bonus action to cast that means we can still attack the creature on our round so we're not really giving up much to cast this spell now it's going to use a concentration so we're not doing it at the same time as we're doing say a bless spell but still in terms of using a concentration, if lockdown is our job, then that's not a bad deal. Now, the other thing is if they want to move further than 30 feet away from us, that would require a saving throw. I don't think that's going to come up all that often. Uh, I think the main thing is the disadvantage to attack our allies. Now, our allies can't attack this. We can't attack anything else but this. Uh, but if we are playing a character that wants to be locking down enemies, Kambel Duel is a decent way to do that. Using a pretty minor first level slot and only a bonus action. The next spell I want to talk about is the Heroism spell. This is another spell that is going to use our concentration. Unlike some of the other spells I'm going to talk about, it's also going to use our action. So there is an opportunity cost here because we aren't going to be able to attack on the same round we cast this spell. However, if we have ourselves frightened or an ally frightened, then Heroism is a good spell to cast. It is going to give them immunity to the frightened condition so that frightened condition is immediately going to go away the other thing is is you get temporary hit points and that temporary hit points is equal to your casting modifier every round now obviously these don't stack so if you have a charisma plus three you're going to give three temporary hit points and if at the beginning of their next turn they still have those three temporary hit points they're not they're not going to get any more but if they're taking damage every round or you're taking damage every round then heroism could provide a ton 
of temporary hit points. And especially if you think maybe a second level paladin, uh, maybe you're a variant human, maybe you already have the heavy armor master feet, uh, and then you throw heroism on top, you could potentially be taking six points of damage every round that doesn't take anything off your actual hit points. Now this does use your concentration. So again, if you cast it on yourself, whenever you lose those temporary hit points, you would have to make a concentration save. So it's not gonna last very long. So it really is probably better on somebody else than yourself, unless you're using it to remove the frightened condition, in which case, then it's perfectly fine. Next, let's talk about the Shield of Faith spell. Uh, now the Shield of Faith spell, I have a little problem with it, and the problem is that it uses concentration. So it's gonna add two to our armor class, uses a bonus action to cast, uh, but then if we are hit, then we're gonna to have to make a concentration save or we're gonna lose it. But still, if I'm playing a character that is a tank style character, I'm trying to draw enemy attacks, then I'm going to want to survive those enemy attacks. And if I have, you know, plate mail or even chain mail and a shield, and I have the defensive combat style, and then I'm adding an additional plus two on top of that, that's a fairly big deal. It's gonna be very hard for most enemies to hit us. Again, as a bonus action cast, there's not really an opportunity cost. We can cast this and we can still attack on our turn. And remember that because of smite, we can still do additional damage without casting spells. So we can use our spells to increase our defense and then our spell slots to increase our offense. Now that uses things up really fast. This is something we find with the Paladin, that those spell slots just cannot last because between casting spells and smiting, things get used up very quickly. Uh, but when we use up those things very quickly, we can be extremely effective in that short spurt. Now, speaking of bursting a lot of things at once, if we wanna do the most damage we can on our turn, what we can do is we can buy a smite with a spell smite. Because we have various spells, they all use concentration, they all use a bonus action, that will add a little bit of damage and a secondary effect to our next weapon strike. And the one I like at first level is Thunderous Smite. So what Thunderous Smite does, again, bonus action to cast, affects your next attack that hits, uh, it lasts up to a minute, it's gonna use your concentration. When that attack hits, the enemy is gonna take an additional 2d6 thunder damage. Thunder damage is very seldom resisted. Uh, and then that enemy is pushed 10 feet and knocked prone. So there's a number of uses there in terms of you might be able to push them off a cliff or push them off a bridge uh, or push them off a rampart. Uh, so that pushing effect can be really useful. And if that pushing effect isn't useful, the knocking prone can provide your allies the ability to attack that enemy with advantage. So Thunderous Smite is a spell that I do find a number of uses for. And remember, if we combine it with a regular first level smite, we could add 2d6 plus another 2d8 to our regular weapon damage, creating quite a bit of damage, even though that uses a lot of resources. But my favorite smite spell for first level is Wrathful Smite. Now, Wrathful Smite only does a d6 damage, but if they fail a saving throw, then they are frightened of you. And in order to make another saving throw, they have to use their action. So they're potentially using multiple actions to try to get rid of this frightened condition or just remain with that frightened condition, which is going to give them disadvantage to attack you and your allies as long as they can see you. Uh, and it's going to prevent them from moving any closer to you. So there's a number of problems with being frightened. But the big thing is rather than getting the automatic saving throw every round, they have to use their action to do the saving throw, which is really good. So when it comes to second level spells, the first one I want to talk about is aid. So aid affects you and two allies, and it gives you all five additional hit points, but not five temporary hit points. It increases your hit point maximum by five points. So the really nice thing about aid, of course, is then it stacks with things that give temporary hit points. So you can get increased maximum hit points and temporary hit points on top of that, which can make a character, especially something like a wizard or a sorcerer that doesn't have very many hit points, it can add a lot of hit points to them. It stacks really nicely too. If we use a higher level slot for it, it's gonna do an additional five per level of slot. So a third level aid actually has twice the effect of a second level aid. In fact, second level aid I think is okay. I think it actually is better stacked to a third or fourth level spell. Eight hour duration is a great duration. It's not using your concentration, so it's probably gonna last the entire time. And again, unlike a temporary hit point, that once it's gone, it's gone. With an increased maximum hit point, we take something like a short rest. You can heal those hit points that you lost that were in that range between your normal maximum hit points and your new maximum hit points. 
My favorite second level spell for Paladins by far is Fine Steed. Uh, Fine Steed is going to give you a mount uh, regardless of your size. It can be summoned, it can be dismissed, it's intelligent. Now, mounts aren't a huge deal in Dungeon Dragons, at least in 5th edition, because if we are on that mount, it's either controlled or uncontrolled. If it's uncontrolled, there's all kinds of problems with that, uh, because having different initiatives just creates tactical issues. Uh, so we'll probably want that mount controlled, which means it's not going to be attacking, which means it's not really increasing our offensive capabilities. Uh, but when it's controlled on your turn, it can take the dash action, it can take the dodge action, it can take the disengage action. Uh, and if you have, say, a warhorse, you have a speed of 60. So it can also move 60. So it moves 60 and it can dodge and then it has disadvantage to be attacked. So you can attack and you now have this much improved maneuverability. If you are in melee and you want to disengage, then the mount can take the disengage action and move you out of melee range and then you still get an action. You can make an attack and then disengage. Or if you just want to cover a massive distance, that mount can dash and then you could move 120 feet and then you still get your action. So what Fine Steed does, it gives you a massive maneuverability. The other thing to note about Fine Steed, especially if you're a medium sized paladin creating a large size mount, is that it changes the mechanics of the battlefield a little bit because now you're covering what is a large creature's area. Now, how that works mechanically is a matter of debate. Uh, according to Mike Merles, and this just seems insane to me, but the idea is, is that your mount covers a large square and then you as a paladin or whatever cover one square within those four and you have to choose which one it is. So if you're using a lance, then if you're in the bottom square, then you don't have reach in front of you. And then if you're in the top square, you do have reach in front of you. Uh, and it affects things like opportunity attacks, all kinds of things. It's a really odd way to look at this thing. This idea that you're climbing over different parts of the horse, uh, depending on the, your round. It's it's insane to me. Uh, the what I think is the more obvious way to deal with this is that once you mount your creature, then you're one creature. You're treated as one creature on the battlefield, covering a large square. If that is the method you use, and I highly recommended, I think it's the only method that really makes sense, then suddenly you are a large creature. And if you're a large creature, that really affects things like reach, uh, things like polar master. Just think how many more squares you're covering with those kind of effects when we're talking about going one hex away from a large creature compared to one hex away from a medium creature. The other thing is that if we have a mount, we can use a lance. And a lance, if you are using a shield, is your best one-handed weapon because it can do a d12 damage and it has reach. Now, if something moves within your reach, uh, then you would have disadvantage on attacks. But remember, your mount can do the disengage action and move one away and then you can attack as normal. Now, sometimes the battlefield isn't doesn't work that conveniently and you can't move five feet away even with the disengage action in which case you're gonna have to drop your lance and drop your sword and attack as normal uh, but overall all kinds of advantages to having a mount maneuverability uh, ability to disengage ability to do more damage with things like a lance ability to cover greater areas with things like reach weapons uh, or just attacks of opportunity in general so Fine Steed, I think, is an amazing spell for a second level. And we haven't even gotten into the fact that it shares your spells. Now, what spells it shares is crazy vague because it says in the spell description that any spell that only targets you will also target your mount. Uh, but now spells that target you but maybe have effects on other creatures don't target your mount according to what Jeremy Crawford has said. Uh, so check with your DM. I'm not even going to comment too much about that, except no matter how they interpret it, it's probably going to be useful some of the time. The final spell I want to talk about at second level is Lesser Restoration. Just like for Rangers, I think this is a decent spell to have. It ends a number of effects that can affect a creature. So it's one of those spells that's circumstantial, but when you need it, it's really important to have it. Now, hopefully, if you're in a party with a cleric or a druid, maybe somebody else has this spell and then you don't need it. But then again, maybe your cleric is the one that's paralyzed. Then they can't cast this spell. Then you having it would make a huge difference. So Lesser Restoration, I think, is a reasonable choice for a paladin. 
So going into third level spells, the first one I want to talk about is Aura of Vitality. I don't think Aura of Vitality is a great spell, but it's okay. Uh, what it does is it gives you a bonus action you can use on your round to heal yourself or one of your allies 2d6 damage. Uh, and we have a number of spells we can do with bonus actions, but other than spells, unless we have appropriate feats, we may not have a lot we're doing with our bonus actions. So being able to heal 2d6 damage around is not a bad thing. And we can do this to any creature within a 30 foot radius of us. Uh, so not as useful as something like a healing spirit, uh, especially a healing spirit cast with a third level slot, but okay. I think it's a decent thing for a paladin to have. The next third level spell I want to talk about is Crusader's Mantle. Now Crusader's Mantle is a spell that sometimes isn't all that useful and sometimes it's really, really good. Uh, and it really depends on the kind of party you have because it's going to use an action to cast, which means there's the opportunity cost of casting it in the first place. And what it's going to do is it's going to increase your weapon damage attack rolls as well as the weapon damage attack rolls of all your allies within 30 feet by 1d4. Uh, and if it's you and maybe another ally, Maybe it's not even worth you using your action to cast this spell, never mind the fact it's using your concentration. But let's say you're playing with, say, a druid, and that druid has just cast a summoning spell, and suddenly you've got eight creatures suddenly pop up within a 30-foot radius of you. Then you cast Crusader's Mantle, and suddenly you're adding 1d4 to all eight of those creatures' attacks, and your attacks and any other allies attacks in that radius and suddenly it makes a bigger deal. It also makes a bigger deal for allies that can do lots of attacks. Things like fighters who can do an action surge or two weapon fighters or archers with a crossbow expert feat uh, because that d4 on every attack is just going to add up more often. Uh, so again this is a spell that can be really good in the right circumstances but I don't think it's always a good spell. I think I hear people talk about this spell in an, with exaggerated effect because again with the, that action cost to cast the concentration there's some times that this isn't going to end up adding to your damage at all it might even subtract from your damage it really depends how many creatures you can affect how many attacks you can affect if you can affect several attacks this is a good spell the final spell I want to talk about at third level is Revivify. If you've played the game you probably know why Revivify is a good spell if you haven't then just know that Revivify is the lowest level raised dead spell you can get. It can be cast within one minute of a character dying. Uh, it uses the least spell components and it's only one action to cast. So Revivify is in many ways the best raised dead spell in the game. Uh, again, that one minute duration can be a problem, but if we're talking about raising our allies, usually we're going to get the opportunity to do that within a one minute time frame of the time they passed away. So being able to do one action with the least amount of components with the lowest spell slot makes this the best raised dead spell in the game and one you definitely want to consider grabbing with your paladin. When we get into fourth level spells, let's talk about banishment. So banishment is a spell that I have called overrated in the past. I still think it's an overrated spell, but I still think it's a decent spell uh, because some people are just crazy about this spell. And, and I think it is reasonably good, uh, but not great. Uh, but you target a single enemy if they save, nothing happens. But if they don't save, they're gone, and they're gone for the time that you concentrate or the entire duration of the spell. There's no saving throw every round to come back. Uh, and if they are a creature that is not from this plane, and you hold it for the entire duration, which is one minute, then they are banished permanently. Now that target becomes incapacitated after you cast this spell, so there's no real way for them to come back, even if they have plane shift ability. Uh, so this is a good way to divide and conquer enemies. Uh, now it is going to rely on a charisma saving throw. Charisma is not a bad saving throw to target. In some cases, charisma is a great saving throw to target. And you often know, you can tell whether a creature is probably going to have a low charisma. And if they do, then banishment is additionally good. And as a paladin, you may have a great charisma. You may not have a fantastic charisma. So your DC might not be as high as a dedicated spellcaster. Something to consider as well, casting this spell, because this isn't something that's adding to your attack damage. This is something that is all or nothing, and it's using your action. The next spell I want to talk about is Death Ward. Death Ward is just another way to layer your defenses. What happens is if you ever drop to zero hit points during the spell effect, it's an eight hour effect, no concentration, then you fall to one hit point instead. So that attack that would drop you doesn't drop you. Uh, now you have one hit point at that point, so you're still in a big pile of trouble, but at least you can act. You can potentially get away. You might potentially be able to take down the enemy. 
Now there is a big resource cost here. We're using a fourth level slot for this ability that may or may not come up during that eight hour period. Uh, but still, when it does come up, it can be very, very useful. It can make the difference between death and life. So Death Ward is actually the perfect name for this spell. The next fourth level spell, and a spell I'm always going to take with a Paladin, is Fine Greater Steed. So Fine Greater Steed is just a huge improvement over the Fine Steed spell because we can get all kinds of creatures that can fly. and can fly at amazing speeds that are very intelligent, that have decent saving throws, uh, that have decent number of hit points. So this is a big boost over Fine Steed spell. As we get into higher levels, the ability to fly is going to become more and more important. So we can assure it with our Paladin because of the Fine Steed spell. And we will be able to fly at a massive movement rate, and we will be able to do so without concentration. Now, if nobody in the party has the Featherfall spell, it's maybe time for them to consider it. Because if your mount does die and you are high up, that could be a big fall for you. Just as with lower levels, we share spells with our fine greater mount, uh, but again, it depends on the DM as to what spells that's going to entail. It, officially, it is spells that target only you, but whether spells target only you when they might affect other creatures, which pretty much every spell is going to do. I mean, a certain way of thinking about it, a shield of faith, if it causes an enemy to miss, you've affected that creature. Is, does that make that creature a target? Uh, by some of the ways that Jeremy Crawford has spoken, you would imagine maybe so. It's so vague. It's so hard to tell. Uh, but I think a reasonable DM is going to have a number of spells that can be shared. So find out what they are and take advantage of them. So this brings us to our fifth level spells, our most powerful spells for Paladin, uh, though I don't think any of them are as good as Fine Greater Steed. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is Banishing Smite. Now I got a bunch of pushback when I said Banishing Smite was an underrated spell because a lot of people pointed out the fact that you don't necessarily know if you're going to be dropping a creature to 50 hit points or at very high levels, a creature's going to have hundreds and hundreds of hit points. By the time you take them down to 50, the battle is maybe pretty close to over and and frankly, the points that were made were reasonably good points. Uh, and when I look at this spell now, I'm maybe less impressed with it than I was then. But I still think it is a reasonably good spell because it's adding a lot of damage to an attack. That attack doesn't have to be a melee attack. And that's very rare for Paladin spells. So we can actually do a ranged attack and do a reasonable amount of damage. And as ways of taking out the big bad guy, maybe not as useful. But as a way of taking out secondary opponents, Still, I think, a reasonably useful spell. Uh, not amazingly powerful, but I would definitely consider it with a Paladin when I'm looking at my 5th level slots. The next spell I'd consider is Circle of Power. Circle of Power has a good duration, 10 minute duration, which means that we can potentially cover multiple combats with this spell. Uh, if we can cast it before a combat, even better, because it is going to use our action to cast. And what it's going to do is it's going to give you and everyone in an area advantage on saving throws versus spells, advantage on saving throws against other magical effects uh, and then if a spell would do damage we're going to take half damage if we fail our save or no damage if we make our save so if i am playing an oath of the ancients paladin there's some redundancy here but for any other kind of paladin i would totally consider this because it is a huge defensive boost not just for you but for your allies and as you go up in levels being targeted with spells becomes more and more common and being able to provide both advantage on saving throws and your charisma bonus to saving throws can mean that allies that normally would have a weak save now have a reasonable chance of making their save, even against spells that target a weak saving throw. The next fifth level of spell that I want to talk about is Destructive Wave. So Destructive Wave is an area of effect spell that originates from use. So we want to be in an area where there are a number of enemies. Uh, it's a 30 foot radius and all enemies that you choose, so there's no friendly fire, all the enemies that you choose within that radius are going to take 10d6 damage, half on a failed save, and if they fail their save, they're not prone. So it is an area of effect spell, does damage, only targets enemies, so it can be used in a chaotic melee, and then it's going to knock your enemies prone, which means that it reduces their movement on the next turn, and if they're attacked before the next turn, you have advantage on attacks. There's nothing here that's huge. 10d6 damage by this level is no big deal. Uh, knock prone at this level is no big deal. Uh, but being able to target only enemies, no friendly fire, and the fact that Paladins don't have a lot of spells that can affect lots of enemies. Most of their spells and their abilities are really good at doing damage to a single enemy. So if we are swarmed with a bunch of lesser enemies, there's not a lot we can do. So Destructive Wave gives us an option, an option that's flexible because of the lack of friendly fire. So I do think it is a reasonable choice for a Paladin 
to get. Now, if I'm playing another class, then maybe this is no big deal, but for a paladin, I think this is a decent option. The final spell I consider at fifth level is Holy Weapon. Uh, now, Holy Weapon is a spell I'm going to want to use if I am a player that has something like the Crossbow Expert feat, or I have something like Polar Master that's going to give me a bonus action attack on my round. Uh, because then with a Paladin, we would expect to be attacking three times a round. Uh, because Holy Weapon is going to give a one hour boost to a weapon that's going to do an additional 2d8 damage uh, with each strike. So that's like a first level smite on every strike. Uh, so if we're attacking three times around, that's 68 damage it's adding to those attacks. Uh, and because it has an hour long duration, we could expect it to last for several combats. Now it's going to use our concentration. So there are a number of other spells that could increase our damage as well. I think Holy Weapon is going to increase them more. Uh, now there's a secondary effect where we can blow away our Holy Weapon and things can be blinded and take a little bit of damage. And in general, I would avoid that one. I would say keep your Holy Weapon for your hour get lots and lots of attacks, each with 2d8 extra, and it's going to add up to uh, quite a bit of damage by the end of the duration. Holy Weapon is one of those spells that I could see also taking with another class, particularly if you're a class that uses a ranged weapon. Uh, something like with a crossbow expert, I could see this working really well because attacking three times around each with an additional 2d8 damage is actually quite a lot of damage. So those are my favorite Paladin spells in the game. What are your favorite Paladin spells in the game and what did I get wrong? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, I appreciate you joining me. And until next time, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax. And I'm going to have some fun because D&D is for everyone. Thanks, Optimancers, and I'll see you next time.